Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship on this March day. You may be seated. I want to thank you, whoever gave me this wonderful package of peanuts. I will share them with the squirrels, okay, and the blue jays. Thank you so much. I thought it was for coffee time. It's for coffee time. <laughs> Squirrel coffee time. <laughs> So folks, question, would you rather be coming out today in March snow or March rain? <laughs> I don't have to show the rain. March, rain. March, rain. March rain. It's that spring. <laughs> we, we all have our different preferences, haven't we, eh? Anyway, we're here and we welcome you. And for those of you who are worshiping with us from home, we also welcome you. Uh, I want to thank Les Sorg for taking the service last Sunday. I was very, very grateful. I know that those of us who were gathered here really felt blessed by the message that you brought, Les, and uh, it gave me a chance to get some more things done that I was wanting to do by way of church work when I didn't have the service to prepare, so I thank you. Um, and um, let me see, there are some announcements to be brought to your attention today. We have no birthdays to announce as far as I know, but uh, our sympathies are... Andrew Ford today? I didn't have that written down. Andrew, happy birthday, okay? I'm sorry, we missed that one. So I'll write it down for the next time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and our sympathies are extended today to John Ogilvy and, the, and his family and the passing of his wife, Toy. So our sympathies, and also Margaret Whittle, um, a, a very close cousin of hers has also passed away, so our, our sympathies go out to those families and anybody else that we may be unaware of, uh, our sympathies to you. Also, we know that uh, there's fighting going on between Russia and the Ukraine, and um, I know that Samaritan's Purse, is, is they've already sent a, a, a hospital over there, and if anybody would like to donate, they can go online, they've uh, got this They've flown it over, and they're able to reach out to people that way. So if you'd like to help some of the people in Ukraine with financial donations, you can you look online and you can go through Samaritan's Purse. That would be a place where you can... And also I've heard that there's some Ukrainian churches in Montreal that are collecting like clothing and things like that. I don't know how to get it to the Ukrainian churches, but I heard on the radio that they're collecting things like that. We're also collecting used soft drink bottles and cans as a fundraiser for uh, Jordan King's medical expenses. And uh, the Connections Ministry under the auspices of Linda and Teddy Hoare, they, uh, they are, they're doing the collecting and so we can bring the cans here and we'll pass them on to them. But also for the youth, they're having a fundraising game day. Uh, it's kind of separated here because of the way it came in in the email. But that's coming up one of these coming Saturdays. I'll pass the information on to you when I've got it better, better set out. Also, if you drink lots and lots of milk, or you know somebody who does, and you get those big bags with three liters, um, the Summerlee United Church is collecting once again those milk bags, and they are making them sleeping mats for homeless people in the Montreal area. Next Sunday, Next Saturday night, the time goes ahead an hour, okay? So just, just, you know, just so you know, if you come in and forget to put your time ahead, we could be saying hello and goodbye to you. <laughs> so, okay. I believe that those are all the announcements to be brought to your attention. Let us come together in worship.
Let us come together in our call to worship on this first Sunday of Lent. With the cross of Christ before us. With the cross of Christ before us. With the cross of Christ before us. We commit ourselves to live that love. With the cross of Christ before us. We come in worship. And let us continue singing throughout these Lenten days and nights. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have brought us to this season of Lent, this time of preparation for crucifixion and resurrection. Please give us courage to examine ourselves, to be honest about who we are and to what we are called, that we might meet with joy on Easter morning our risen Savior, to whom with you and the Spirit one holy God, be honor and praise, now and forever. And we join together in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Luke and Laura are going to uh, have our Lenten candle liturgy this morning. Um, you can see the candles are shorter. It is very hard to find tall purple candles. So. We are using purple short candles. Uh, now, I did put a new... There are many temptations we face in our lives together. We face the temptation of putting our wants above another's needs. We face the temptation of ignoring problems such as hunger, poverty, war, and disease with the false hope that they will go away without our intervention. We face the temptations of wealth and consumerism. We face many temptations to stray from the path of our faith. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith in Jesus Christ to help us resist the temptations of the world.
encouraging it is to know that the teens in our church don't know how to use a cigarette light. <laughs> <laughs> our hands outstretched and our hearts open to you. As we journey towards the cross this Lenten season, keep us from temptations and help us to do your work in our world. Amen. Thank you, Luke and Laura. And Keith, if they tried to light a cigarette with that lighter, they would have been having real problems too. <laughs> Time with the children. So, children, <laughs> do you like, do you have favorite movies with actors that you like, or favorite books that you might read that you would like sometime maybe to meet? one of the characters in the story or that um, you see on, on, on a movie. Um, when Anna Green Gables first came out, of course, Anna Green Gables is such a delightful movie, but when the doctor came in to take care of her friend's little sister, I thought, I know that man. I used to babysit his children in Toronto when I was going to Bible college. They, uh, he went on different movies, Sean McCann, he went on, he was on different shows afterwards, but uh, he passed away recently. But he used to babysit his children. They preferred to have, uh, some of the people in that apartment building preferred Bible college students taking care of their children compared to some of the university students that lived there. But um, also, you know, someday maybe you might like to say, oh, I'd like to meet, I don't know what young people watch these days, but back in our days it was like Superman and, and uh, you know, those, those different characters. But I just read about a lady. Uh, she was very, very sick. And she loved Bambi, the little deer, Bambi. And she was very, this lady was an older woman. She was very, very sick. And she used to watch Bambi with her daughter. And the daughter wanted to do something very, very special for her mom. And so the daughter phoned around and she found a farm where there was a little deer, a fawn. And her mom was lying there, and the, these people drove like two and a half hours to bring this little fawn to this lady who was probably dying. And she walked, they walked in with this little deer, and the deer's name was Bambi. And she got to pet the little deer before she passed away. And it was so moving, and the people did not charge. They wanted to do this out of the kindness of their heart to do something kind. But I'm thinking, you know, we come and we, we, we sing about Jesus, we listen about Jesus. We may never get to meet the movie characters that we like, but someday with our trust in Jesus, we'll get to meet Jesus that we read about and we sing about. So that's something for us to look forward to. If we're trusting him, that is our reality. So we're going to sing today, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love.
I don't know what you can hear of your singing down there, but here it is just marvelous. You are in fine tune today. I've been it for two years. <laughs> it's just great. I have two scripture passages to share with you this morning. The one is, first one is from the Gospel of St. Luke, and I'm reading from St. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. It has to do with Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So, if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from, from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him with an, until an opportune time. And then I'm reading from Romans chapter 12, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, excuse me, starting with the second part of verse 8. St. Paul writes, Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Whoops, wrong chapter, but that was good anyway. Again, Paul writes, the Lord is near you. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, everyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thanks be to God Amen. for his holy word.
Thank you, choir. That's from Psalm 91. And um, as I was reading this scripture passage from Luke, when the devil was trying to tempt Jesus, it was a verse out of that psalm that Satan uses. It. Let's just jump. God will, God will hold you if you jump. He used that. It's so Psalm 91 was very familiar to Jesus. He knew what, what was in there, and it's a beautiful passage. We come today on this first Sunday of Lent, the first six, of the six weeks, Lent being the six weeks in the Christian church preceding Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And we're remembering that the Christmas baby Jesus before whom the shepherds and the wise men knelt has now grown up, that he went about doing good, and we are now preparing to remember his great achievement of going to the cross, of dying, and of rising from the dead on the third day. And most of us are familiar with the various accounts leading up to those historical moments. But maybe just now, with all that is going on in the world, with a health pandemic and the threat of a great war and fighting already going on, it may be a little difficult to find these scripture passages today of any relevance. A book title on one of my bookshelves at home today uh, uh, caught my attention this week. The book title was Preaching During a Revolution. And uh, that seemed timely, so I started to read its preface, including these words. As we communicate, we find ourselves grappling with terms that keep calling our attention to the fact that these are days of revolution. Consider these, Iron Curtain, Intercontinental Missiles, Nuclear Warfare, Fallout Shelters, Bomb Shelters, Astrojets, Earth Satellites. I thought, wow, timely. I looked at the date when this book was published, 1962. 60 years ago. So some here will have no problems remembering back till then. Uh, but you can see that we've been struggling with similar challenges for a long time. And the minister who wrote that book said that people have a need, that crises raise questions. He says the questions that crises raise is, are, does man have worth? Does the world have meaning? Is there a God capable of substantiating a positive answer to each of these questions? He writes, in spite of Marxism and secularism, multitudes long for a realization of God. Many want the unknown God to portray himself in such a dramatic way that they can be confident of his reality. Some cry out that they are dying, that they are all alone. For such, it is increasingly clear that the Christian faith is no longer optional, it is a requisite for life. And so yes, as we come to the scriptures today, we can come realizing that with all that is going on, our time for worshiping and reflecting on God is of vital importance as human beings. We recall St. Paul's words from the Roman passage we just read, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We recall Jesus saying that he came to give us abundant life. So then how does Jesus being tempted have anything to do with us? After all, don't we all have temptations as part of life, right? But you may have heard of the man who decided that he wanted to lose some weight. Speaking of temptations, he was very diligent and stuck to his diet very strictly. He even had a new route to go to work so that he wouldn't drive by his favorite bakery in the morning. However, one day he came into work with a big coffee cake. His co-workers started to scorn him, and he said that he could explain. He said, you see, I, I accident 
accidentally drove past my favorite bakery today, and I saw all these delicious coffee cakes out on the display case. And so I prayed. I prayed to God and said, if you really think I should have this delicious coffee cake, have an open parking spot right in front of the bakery. And soon enough, there was one on my eighth time around. <laughs> what temptations have we talked ourselves into getting into? We all have our areas of weakness, right? Some have mild weaknesses. Some are terribly destructive. Jesus, as a human being, had his too. And in doing studies for these reflections, I've come to appreciate his way of coping much, much more in terms of how he is there now for us because of what he went through there. You may recall that Jesus went into the wilderness just after he'd been baptized. His baptism signaling that he was starting his ministry. At his baptism signifying his allegiance to God, the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove, like the dove that we have up on the stained glass window, of the stained glass window dove up there. It, it came down in the form of a dove, and he heard God, his heavenly Father, saying, You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. What a high that must have been for Jesus. Like a graduation ceremony. The hope of good things to come, a celebration. But then, here we see that he was led by God's spirit into the desert, the wilderness, away from people. Not what we'd expect for someone called to save people, right? Have you ever found yourself in a wilderness, in the sense of feeling isolated, alone, very alone. Maybe you're still with people, but inside you feel like no one knows what you're going through. It's easy to praise God when everything is good, going good, right? But don't we also have a wilderness experiences in our lives when everything seems so destitute? To name a few, it might be bereavement. It might be loss of health. It might be loss of a dream, loss of friendships, loss of a job. There are very real times when temp these are very real time times when temptations can set in for us to do our own things, even if we know that they're not health giving. We are tempted to abandon God. We figure, who cares? Nobody cares, not even God. The devil tempted Jesus as to who Jesus is and how he could use his power to suit his own comfort. Three temptations are mentioned here, but if Jesus had given even into even one of them, his ministry would have been destroyed and we would have no hope. And so the first temptation, Jesus was hungry, after not eating for 40 days. How long can we go for without food? Can you imagine not going with food for that long? So the devil comes along and he says, hey Jesus, you're hungry, eh? You know, you've got the power to turn these stones into bread, eh? How tempting, Jesus could have done it. But Jesus answers, the scriptures say, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus was indicating that there's more to life than material comfort. We're not just physical beings. Someone has said that humans are not bodies with souls. We're souls with bodies. But how much time and money do we spend seeking material acquisitions? There's nothing wrong with having nice things and food. But Jesus wants us to remember that first of all, the most important thing is to be in the right relationship with God who loves us, who created us for fellowship with him. 
Remember in the story of creation, God said, let us, let us, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, in our likeness. We're not animals and we're not a fluke of nature. Humans are the highest of God's creation and given the ability to communicate with him. But according to the scriptural account, humans decided to go their own way and brought on this brokenness. Wonderfully though, God never stopped loving us. And in our brokenness, Jesus came as a human being to identify with us in all our stresses and strains that we as humans go through. Although he could have sighed, satisfied his own hunger discomfort by turning stones into bread, he knew that humans can't do that. When we're hungry, we can't take a stone and turn it into bread. And so uh, to identify with us, he would not do it. Don't you appreciate that about him? He knows from his own experience what we experience. He knows just how we feel. Secondly, the devil showed Jesus a great view of the land. It says all the world, so it might have been a kind of a vision and said, hey, Jesus, this is all mine. If you'll worship me, I'll give it all to you. The devil knew that Jesus desired that all people would know him, but Jesus would not use the devil's devices to get that recognition. The devil was encouraging Jesus to compromise with him. And how often do Christians compromise our beliefs to fit in. We tell ourselves, well, everybody's doing it these days. That's the way, it's the only way to get ahead or to keep the peace. We just have to go along with the flow. Everybody's doing it. We compromise our values with the world. And how many world powers do we see today doing that or forcing their power over people? Jesus knows that God's way of people following him is the way of love. And so Jesus said, it is written, written, worship the Lord and serve him only. Jesus was saying, I'm not worshiping you, Satan. I'm not. I will serve God only. Jesus would not compromise God's way of reaching out to people. And thirdly, the devil showed Jesus a high tower of the temple. Again, I think it might have been a vision. A very high part of the temple overlooked was it the Valley of Kedron or something like that. It was a very steep drop. And it, you know, Jesus was still in the wilderness, so this was likely a vision of what he could do. And, and the devil said, if you're the son of God, you can throw yourself down from here because the scriptures say the angels will lift you up. Psalm 91, right? He will lift us up on evil things. The devil, God says he, he will lift you up. But the devil was trying to make Jesus question himself. If you are the son of God, you can do this, you know, and God is going to protect you. And he was mis misusing scriptures to lure Jesus in. And Jesus said, it is written, don't put God to the test. And this is often a real point of temptation for us too. We tell God in so many words that we will follow him if he does what we want him to do for us. You know, God, I'll do this if you will do this. Remember that story? That story where the man fell over a cliff and he was hanging on by a, a twig and he was calling out for help. Help, help, somebody help me. And you heard a voice from up above saying, okay, I'm here to help. What do you want me to do? And he said, who is that? And he said, I'm God, I'm here to help you. That's really you, God? Yes, I'm here to help you. Okay, God, help me. Will you do what I say? Will you have faith in me? Yeah, I'll trust you. Okay let go and the man says is there somebody else up there you know we don't always want to do as god i 
I didn't want to come to, I, I didn't want to, I loved doing hospital ministry. I didn't want to go back into parish ministry. But I felt that this was God calling me to do, go back into parish ministry. I was scared stiff. I didn't want to do it. God said, trust me, trust me. It's hard to trust and put your confidence in God sometimes. When he asks you to do something that you know it's his will, but you, you need to trust him. It's hard, it's hard. But I love being here. <laughs> I love being here. God knew what he was doing. I hope you think he knew what he was doing too. <laughs> But Jesus said um, in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, God, be done. Not mine, yours. So we're definitely encouraged to bring our requests and our desires to God, but to ultimately trust him in his wisdom to make the final decision. All this to say that Jesus overcame temptation by ultimately trusting God, his father's wisdom and love. A mother bade farewell to her daughter heading off to college, and she, she could have given her many rules and regulations by which to live. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. But you know how young people are sometimes, as much as older people, Luke and Laura, we, we find ways to get around things, right? Instead, so she could have gotten around some of those, some of those guidelines. Instead, the mom assured her daughter of her love for her. And the daughter, knowing this, left desiring that she would honor her mom's love for her. She did not want to let her mom down by the way she might live at university or college because of her mother's love for her. And I expect that Jesus left the wilderness in the same way. I honor my father in heaven. I will follow him. Disregard the temptations of this world to do what I would like to do. I will follow my, my father in heaven. I expect Jesus left the wilderness much more strengthened in his resolve to follow God's plan for his life, no matter the cost. And we can go forward too, knowing that we are not alone. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. And he speaks on behalf of his Father, God too, that God is always with us, whether we can see him or not. God has a purpose for this world. He loves this world. He calls us to trust him. And so may the words of the Lord's Prayer be our focus as it was for Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our petitions for daily sustenance give us this day our daily bread. And for help when we fail, forgive us our trespasses as we relationally forgive those who trespass against us. And keep us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to worship, as we go into the world, may that be our focus and may that be our trust. May that be our purpose as we live in a world that's topsy-turvy. God loves us. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Forty days and forty nights we're going to sing.
You may be seated. As our prayer, as, as our song as we come to prayer, we're going to sing, O oh God of Bethel. And somebody asked me this week, what is Bethel? What does it mean? We sing it, but no idea what it means. And so Bethel, if you recall the story of Jacob, when he was fleeing from his brother Esau after he stolen, Jacob had stolen his birthright, um, he, he fled and he lay down at a place called Bethel. And remember, um, you know that song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder? Um, he put his head on the pillow and he had this dream of the angels coming down and going back up and God speaking to him and assuring him that God knew where he was and that God was with him. And so Bethel in the Bible is known as a place of sanctuary. And amazingly, it is the second most named place in the Old Testament compared to Jerusalem, next to Jerusalem. Bethel is the next one. So when we think of, O oh God of Bethel, think of, O oh God of sanctuary, a place where you are. Okay? So we come to see. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pause on our life's journey once again to regain our focus on who we are and where we're going and how we're getting there. So often we rush ahead and we're caught off guard like someone slipping on ice. We need to remember to put on our ice grippers, which in life is to hang on to you. You have said that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You have said that in the world we will have difficulties, but to be of good cheer that you have overcome the world. And so, Lord, we come to you confessing our great need to trust in you. We are aware of our frailties, of how easily we succumb to temptations that take us away from the life you desire for us. We are also so often afraid and weary as we try to live our lives in a world full of challenges. May our eyes and minds be open to the awareness that we are not alone, that you are with us and that you care for us. In that assurance then, we bring our concerns to you. We bring our prayers to you for the violence in different places in the world. Today, we lift up prayers for people in the Ukraine and in Russia. We lift up prayers for people in Afghanistan and in Nigeria and all other places of the world where, where there is violence, even in downtown Montreal. We ask for wisdom for those in leadership with great decisions to be made. We ask for safety for those who are seeking to bring aid to those in need. We ask for wisdom as people still try to deal with the pandemic and its repercussions as we try to recover. We ask for strength for all those on duty 
in caring for people, whether it be medical care or governing decisions, teaching in stores, on the roads. We pray today for all those in our prayer list and all those on all those who, who love those who are named. And we lift up prayers for those now on our prayer list. We care for them, Lord. Some are known to us, others are known to others, but you love them all, Lord. Some are struggling week by week through various illnesses. Some, it won't be long maybe before they join, pass on into eternity. Give them your strength, we pray, in the sense of your presence. Please give them healing in the way you choose and peace of mind. We pray for all those who are in mourning over the loss of loved ones. We pray for the Ogilvies and the Whittles in their loss of dear family members and all others who are remembering loved ones this day. Lord, may we remember your love for us, that Jesus came to give us life. May we trust in you and bring that message of hope and assurance to those around us. In Jesus we pray, amen. We have good news to bring to the world. God loves us. He can be our foundation, our steady force. We've a story to tell to the nations. Let's sing it.
Let us go into the world today with a vision of God's love for the world. He wants good for the world. And let us go knowing that we can bring that message of hope. And may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Safe trip back into your home. You have a wonderful week.